flow state is an optimal, it's the most optimal mindset that we're in. It's the most efficient brain and mind processing known to us. And when we drop into a flow state, we tend to almost have a magical experience. It's not magic, but there's a sense of awe that comes with it. There's a distortion of time. And when I speak to great athletes, people that are at the top of their game at what they do, most people report that it's somewhere between 10 to 15% of the time, which means that the majority of the time, even the best in the world, they're working. They're not dropped into this easy flow process where everything's proficient. They're working, and they're working really hard to try to bring their mind to a positive mindset. And that's where the real work is, because if you can hang out in a positive mind long enough, the idea is that you'll slip into no mind. I think we play games for a lot of reasons. I think th th there's, there's obviously a lot of psychology involved and just the, the, the basic reward mechanisms that you feel good when, when that dopamine comes in there and, and you just, you have fun, you win. It's a way for us to win on a, on a way that uh, doesn't have a lot of risk involved, but we can really get that psychological thrill. And I think with, uh, with, with Gran Turismo, it, it offers that sense, especially now, where you can play online with other people, that you really sort of reaffirm the skills that you've refined, and you say, well, I really am better than that other person. And it's a way, a safe environment for us to test ourselves, I think, and to experience, uh, to, experience to, to challenge ourselves and to experience what we're actually capable of. Oi 
たまたま参加してたのが山内さんなんですで、えー「なんか質問ないですか?」って言ってこう手を挙げたのが山内さんでで、あのー、多分ゲームを作る上で疑問に思ってる車の挙動だとかそういうことの質問だったと思うんですけれども、あのー、答えることができなかったんですね。でまあそこで「なんででしょうね」っていう話になって、えー、そこで名刺交換をしたのがあの山内さんとの接点というか一番最初の出会いです。去年ですねあのニルで、えー、スタートラインに並ぶ時にみんなレーシングスーツを着ていこうって言って、えー、レーシングスーツを着ようとしたんですねしたら「僕のレーシングスーツないんですよ」で「あれレーシングスーツない?」とかって言ってたら僕のスーツを山内さんが着てましたあの結構だからレース前になるとナーバスになるというかこう緊張するタイプ。って思ってます。あとタバコ吸う回数がすごい増えて First time and hearing that he races, and he not only races wins. I mean, wins a lot. That's kind of incredible. He's a really good driver. I mean, I was surprised when I first I drove with him at Motegi that first time at Gran Turismo 2, and yeah, I just go, whoa, he's no, you know, it's like I get it now. Now I know why this game is so accurate and so representative of the real thing. The guy who created it, he, he knows how to drive. そうですねあの僕はグランツーリスモでドライビングを覚えてから実際にリアルカーを走,りはじ走らせ始めたのであのグランツーリスモで感じていた車との一体感あの自分の手足のようになって、えー、走っていく感じっていうのが、まあ、リアルカーでも起きるリアルなレーションカーでも起きるっていうことがあの分かって、まあ、ある意味ちゃんと裏が取れたというかね。あの自分自身,自身で体験することができたのでその辺りはあの自信を持てる部分なんですよね。He races,、um, which puts him at a different level. So he understands what he's doing. So it's not just simulating it, he actually has a reference point of what real racing is about. And when you have that reference point and you figure that that's going in the game, 
You know, we were just in a review a few minutes ago with him on a project we're working in. And he, he gave insights to things that he thought that, I think this would be important because this is what you would actually need to do for the real car. So he can pull reality from his experiences and apply it to the application of, of, of a project. I, I, I think um, pioneers that are doing something unique and new, people want to listen to. He's proven. He, he, has, he has a pedigree that I think gives him uh, a lot of leeway to do some unique things. Question 12. 12. Um, uh, the game is nearly perfect. What else do you think you can improve on? What else is there left to do? まあ、中学時代の思い出というのはとにかく僕の友達たちっていうのは刺激的だったんですよねで毎日毎日その友達たちと、えー、どっちがかっこいいことができるのかっていうことをこう競争してたような気がしますでどれもが面白いやつでどれもがすごいやつで,でそんな中で14歳の時に。映画を作ろうっていうことで映画を撮り始めたんですね。ただ今ほどいい機材はないですから、当時は8ミリのフィルムでした。僕はこんな小さな子供の頃から家中の壁には真っ白な画用紙が貼られていて、で僕は好きな絵をそこに描くことができたんですね。で全てを書き尽くすと親がその紙をいつの間にか全部また白い紙に変えてくれていたあのそういう家でしたからあのそんな中で僕が、えー、デザインというものあるいは絵を描くというものに対して何かこう育っていったんじゃないかっていう気がします。Uh, joined uh, Sony Music Entertainment Japan,、uh, which was the music company, <laughs> and obviously, you know, publishing and producing music. And、uh, Sony Music Japan at that time had a small video game uh, uh, group、uh, producing games for Nintendo and Sega systems. So he joined you know, Sony Music Entertainment Japan, became one of the you know, young members、uh, producing titles for those systems. でまあ、僕は正直びっくりして「え俺がゲ,ゲーム作るの?」っていう感じだったんだけども、まあ、ちょっと考えてみたらあの、まあ、自分自身のバックグラウンドも含めてビデオゲームは確かに作れるなと思ったんですよね。Back in the early 90s, when Sony was first starting to think about a PlayStation console,、uh, Kazunori wanted to produce this car game that he wanted to produce since he was 15 years old. And、uh, he approached the, the Sony executives and the, the people in charge of the, the games at the time that, and explained to them what he wanted to do. But they really weren't interested in a car game. They presumably weren't car people, and they didn't think that a, car, that a game. That technical or that focused would really sell. でその辺りからまあ確かにビデオゲームを作るっていうのは企業にとっては投資だからなんかそんな簡単に自分の好きなものが作れるわけじゃないんだなってことは分かりました。まあ、あるアアイディアを思いついつて、まあ、それは具体的にはまあ別の装いを持ったビデオゲームでそれはその当時ヒットしていたビデオゲームのような装いを持ったビデオゲームの中にグランツリスモを隠すっていうことだったんですねでそれが「モータートゥングランプリ」というタイトルで外から見るとまあ任天堂のよく売れていたビデオゲームのように見えるでも中で行われるトライ僕らができる試行錯誤というのはグランツイスムにつながるものでした。The amazing、uh, car physics engine was so realistic, and the, you know, some in industry people noticed what Kazunori team was doing, and、uh, became、uh, you know something to watch out for. And of course, you know his team's、uh, third project was the Gran Turismo. So, so. Um, when you know, we waited long enough to have something tangible that we could show,、uh, 
uh, that was the uh, early prototype of the uh, uh, Gran Turismo with the amazing, you know, never seen before reflection mapping of the car. You know, when the car spins, the lighting reflections changes and uh, was amazing. So, you know, executive no mina san mo, ma, sugoku, nante no kana, boku ni jiu o ataete kreta to yu ka. So, that tara kaisha o tsukute, ano, ski na yo ni yareba yi yo, te yu funi, ale mi, ko, release ste kreta no desu yo ne, boku o. それはすごくありがたかったですねもう戦う必要はなくてあとは自分と仲間たちで少ないように勝負すればいい So, this is a book of the 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 book of これを蹴るとねこれを蹴ると心臓が上に伝わってカブトムシが驚いて落ちてくるガンと蹴った後にガンと蹴った後にフッて待ってるとパサッて落ちる音が聞こえる。でそこがカブトムシが落ちてきた場所ですね。それをこういう木がを見つけたら全部繰り返す。森のすべての木で繰り返す。そうするとどんどんカブトムシやクワガタが取れる。その昆虫を取るっていうのはまさにこうハンティングですよね。で、そのハンティングの快楽っていうのは、まあ例えばドライビングにもつながるし、レースにもつながるし、あるいはゲームを作る前にのデータキャプチャリング、撮影だとか、あのそういうものにもすべてつながっていますよね。すべてはなんかこう男の狩猟本能というか、あのそこにつながってくると思いますね。
とコースを作る、まあ、そのやり方なんですけれどもまず僕らがこの取材チームが、まあ、この場所に行きますで、まあ、全体の景観をまず感じるところから始まりますね。全体の景観を感じ、えー、いよいよ、えー、それぞれの、まあ、素材を撮影することになるんですけれども、えーとまあ、こういった路面であるとか、えー、とああいった縁石であるとか、えーとね、カリフォルニアの光だとすごく分かりやすいですね僕らが撮るイメージ、えー、テクスチャーというのは、まあ、こういった路面のテクスチャーから、えー、こういった縁石、えー、それからこの外側のね、えーコース外のテクスチャーそういうものもイメージで撮りますあとレーザーでスキャンされる、えー、サーフェスというのはもちろんこれら全てがレーザーでスキャンされるわけですねこういった凹凸ひび割れこのレーザースキャナー上ではちゃんと凹凸になってまあでも写真も大事だし測定も大事なんだけれどももしかすると一番大事なのはここに来る制作チーム、まあ、大体20人ぐらい来ますけれども、えー、みんながこのコースのねこの光空気、えー、雰囲気をまあ掴んで帰るってことでしょうねそれが一番大事かもしれないね。セオの中なんですけどあの実際はサーキットはコロッセオの外側を走るので中が見えることは決してないんですけれどもあの今後何が進化するかわからないのであの実は中もちゃんと外ほどではないですが見られても。大丈夫なぐららいいちゃんと作られていますで本当はここは映ることはないぐらい見えない場所ですがあのこうやって進化した時にいつでも対応できるようにちゃんと作っているところがあのデータをこう全体的に見ても結構テンションが上がって好きで好きな部分です。There's a camera shot of a, a beautiful car set in a beautiful location, just sort of moving around in different locations, looking at the car. And you look at it, and you could sort of sit, sit there for a good five, ten minutes just staring at the screen. And it's just a, it's a work of art. And, but when it comes down to it, it's just code. But I think it's, it's a bit more than that, really. They say code is poetry. That's a, a computer science、uh, term. When you learn to program, that's one thing they say. It should, it should be like poetry. It changes you. It makes you think about cars differently. It makes you think about the, the, the world differently. I have, I've learned so much about other countries and other forms of racing and other people. I've read the, the, the documents that, that go along with the cars and the tracks. And you learn so much, and it makes your world so much bigger. After you've experienced the game. But really, if you say, what is the game? It boils down to these lines of code. One of the interesting aspects of modern origami is that in many cases, you can't break it down into step by step processes like. The traditional origami. All the folds have to come together almost at once. So, with that type of design, we'll very often spend some time putting in all the creases ahead of time and then try to bring all of them together at once. It's a skeleton, it's, it's a scaffolding. And a crease pattern captures. The important elements of something,、um, but it rarely captures every fold in the, in the figure. And, and so it's, it's less than a blueprint, it's more of the abstract essence. I need to get from the subject to a folded representation of the subject, and I can break that down into steps. And the first step is to figure out what are, the, what are the elements of the subject that I want to replicate in the paper. Because any representational origami, it's not a 
a perfect photograph or a perfect sculpture. It's not a perfect reproduction. It, uh, we have to pick certain elements that are gonna call that subject to the mind of the viewer when they see it. One way of describing the abstraction is making a stick figure or a drawing because that's got, that tells me how many legs and how long they are and so forth. And that's pretty easy step because we can, we can draw stick figures pretty easily. That's our first step of drawing when we're a child. But going from the stick figure to a paper shape that has the same structure, that's the step that is particularly amenable to mathematics. I began to see a lot of these principles in origami that seemed very much like the principles that governed engineering and that one could use mathematics to, to do better art. There's really deep connections between the meshing problem of 3D gaming and the crease pattern problem of origami design. And so there are origami algorithms that that are basically mesh, meshing algorithms that say represent this surface by a bunch of polygons that satisfy certain rules about their positions and angles. What we're trying to do as, as an origami artist, what Kazanori is trying to do as a, as a video game, is create an experience inside someone else's brain. And so you kind of have to put yourself in there. And so the decisions that we make in this abstraction process are not just what to include, what to omit, but also what to exaggerate, what to put in that's not actually there, but that will give the desired result in, in the viewer's mind. You know, in everything we do here, everybody's always amazed that, you know, we still sculpt full-size clay cars. Every day we do that here. We have a set of craftsmen, sculptors that do it, and, um, We'll mill the car, bring it back onto a plate, we'll model it by hand, we'll white light scan it, bring it back into the tube, tune it again, and kind of go back and forth as kind of a little bit of a artistic ballet between digital and analog. And we may build a polygonal model, math model, mill it out in one of our giant mills, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a craftsman's hand, cleaning the model down, getting lunch just right. I think at the end of the day, it'll always be touched by the human hand to make it um, or give it that soul, I guess. I started uh, working out of my mom's garage. Um, just uh, driven to, you know, to get my hands at shaping, I uh, used to strip down old longboards. And uh, that's how I kind of started. I've been doing it since uh, the summer of 1973, so this will be going into my uh, fifth decade of shaping boards. As a shaper, you know, the holy grail is like when a, a customer brings a board to you and it's a magic board and he says, you know, can you replicate this exact board? And uh, so that, that, that eventually started down that CNC road and the accuracy and then being able to obtain, you know, empirical data that you could always go back to reference. This has been like an eight year uh, process for me to build this machine. I uh, originally uh, had no uh, background in CNC technology or CAD CAM technology. So it was, uh, it's, it was a long project for me. What's common nowadays is uh, they have the turnkey shaping machines that you could purchase, and uh, you're basically uh, writing programs in 2D. The algorithm formulates the third dimension. Uh, you're not really working in true 3D. The way I actually do is I take my hand shapes and actually digitize the entire surface. And uh, so it maintains the uh, natural hand-shaped, uh, you know, uh, 
I don't know what you would call it, just a non-algorithmic look to it. It has more of a hand-shaped, non-digital uh, appearance to it. Right now, what I'm doing is just basically tear, taking down all the tool paths that the uh, CNC machine has uh, cut with the uh, program that I've written for the board. Aesthetic is really nice, but you know, I try to add little style points to the boards for sure, but um, the rider is the one that has a soul and the rider and the board have to connect. And you know, if that ultimately, if, if I fail at that point there, you know, I basically failed as a shaper. Physics engine え、様々な振る舞いを行うための、なんていうのかな。モデル、ま、数式の塊、それを作る作業ですね、フィジックスエンジンを作るというのは。僕自身もこう20年間こう、ま、その車とは何かっていうテーマをずっとえっと追いか
soon as I graduated art school, I took a full certified welding class, and it just seemed like the next logical step for me. I didn't really expect I would ever build a bridge or building, but I really wanted to understand the medium. I wanted to understand all of the right ways to do it and how far it could be pushed. In my mind, it changed how I looked at things a lot. Uh, I no, no longer saw things as being broken or useless. I saw them as waiting to be repurposed or fixed or modified in some fashion. All of the giant figures were uh, designed to represent different religions from around the world. I think what's kind of unique about the experience of these is from a distance you see a large silhouette and as you approach you can start recognizing that there are items in here that are familiar to you, whether it's a spring or a kitchen faucet or a tool. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that people can relate to in these sculptures and I think it's uh, kind of amusing to discover these, these little bits. And I want people to just be drawn up into the magic of the sculpture and forget anything they know about reality. I want them to just think it's always been there and they discovered it and it was there for them. Uh, I think that really is, is the height of the artistic journey is when a viewer is unaware that this has, you know, 16 uh, outriggers underneath the ground that are holding it up. You know, they, they don't understand the, the engineering behind all that and they shouldn't. You know, if, if I've done my job well, they don't even think about it. So I think similarly to take a car out of the context of a parking lot and put it on a pedestal, you're forced to look at it as an artistic object and just see its, its physical characteristics. I first took a car and took a car and took a car and took a car. I can't forget the feeling of my body. 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 でその気になればど,どこまでも遠くまで行けるあのでその時の感動って今でも覚えていてで今自動車に乗る時にその都度感じる喜びっていうのも基本的に当時と変わらないですよねなんか自分の体自分の,の,あの身体の能力がパッとこう拡張されてで生身の状態ではできないこと。それはまあスピードだったりあるいは遠くまで行くことだったりしますけどあのそういうことができるようになるっていうのは、うん、車を運転する上でものすごく大事な魅力の一つだろうと思いますね。えっとね、それはまさにそうなります、えっと、車と,一体との一体感というのはグランツーリスモをプレイしている時にも完全に起きていてで今この瞬間にこうリアタイヤがどれぐらい路面に設置しているのかでどれぐらい設置しているのかあるいは今タイヤのパフォーマンスのうちのどれぐらいをこう旋回に使っていてあとどれぐらいスロットルが踏めるのかみたいなことは手に取るように分かりますよね。だからうんそう思いますグランツイスもやっていてこう乗れてきた時って自分でも分かるんですねスッと入ってくるで車と完全に一体になってしまうでその時はもう4つのタイヤのが今どんな状態なのかっていうのが完全に自分の体の一部のように感じられるそういう瞬間はありますね。
first got on this track, I'd say I was five. I grew up here. This is where I started my racing career. Um, Dave uh, helped me tremendously uh, just learning how to drive and uh, just get me to that next level to, to start my career. Let's go over some stuff real quickly, though, on our board. Remember our points of measurement? Say turning point. Turning point. Say apex. Apex. Release the car all the way to the exit. Release the car all the way to the exit. Right. Release to the exit. And when we release to the exit, we get grip in the rear, right? Grip in the yeah. rear. Remember the whale's back I showed you? This is yes. the whale's back. If you dive in too soon, it sends all your energy to the pit. We don't want to do that. We want to come in, sacrifice, touch, Add, add more, 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 most. Sacrifice to be efficient, to be effective. What's effective? Fast momentum, carrying it uphill, right? All the way up. Let me have your helmet. Come here. Let's remember this. Watch, guys. Watch, watch, watch. Two mechanisms. Watch what happens here. Watch, watch. Feeding my chin. Feed my hands. Feed my chin. Feed my hands, right? Feed, feed. That's going to prevent you from leaning, right? All the bite and grip comes from the outside tire. So we feed, we feed, right? Are you guys ready for your day? Yeah. Not a whole lot of sugar, tons of water. Yeah. Okay? So All Mitchell right. is 15 and he is a Red Bull athlete. They picked him up about two years ago, so he was the youngest in their arsenal of athletes. And he transitioned in from go-karts to off-road racing trucks to open wheel and now Global Rallycross. So he's got about 10 years of driving experience, but he doesn't even have a legal driver's license yet. So it's pretty cool. I'm seriously thinking about doing an axle change. I think the car is loose. He said something about it being loose, but he said it was great. Then he, then he said it was sticking, so. It's the beauty of uh, having a seven-year-old for your, for your uh, driver input. All right. Front end's good. Cole, hand me the ratchet, son. I'm gonna take the change the rear width and yep, put foot tires on. We only got about three. Thank you, sir. We only have about uh, five minutes to the main to the heat race. So, how much you have invested in my car? In the car itself or the entire program? Program. Embarrassed to say, but I do have my wife's buy-in, so I'm good. Upwards of 25 to 30 uh, in terms of just capital cost, and then the operating expense becomes probably 1,000 to 1,200, uh, barring no major incident. And with major incident, we can get into a couple thousand a weekend. I mean, I, I, I can't remember the go-karting cost. Um, I do know that it does get expensive even at a young age because a lot of the fathers would show up with nine different motors for their little kid's go-kart for a race. and. You know, how do you compete with that? We'd have one and maybe a tired backup motor. <laughs> so um, we just, that's what we did. And when he transitioned into off-road trucks, that got expensive. I mean, that was probably, uh, we were probably sinking seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 just for a series and a little off-road truck. Um, you have repairs and practices and motor rebuilds. Um, now that he is going into the rallycross, I honestly couldn't tell you <laughs> how much that's gonna cost. Look at my line, guys. Look at my line. Look what direction I'm headed. Come with me. Look at the direction. Turning point, apex, apex. What's an apex? Point of measurement, what's an apex? What's an apex? Point of measurement. What's an apex? Point of measurement. Apex. Release. All right, guys, and uh, we are ready to start. Please go ahead. Go a little faster, a little faster. Go faster, faster, faster. Keep it going, keep it, keep it, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Ah!
It's so incredibly hard to get into motorsport, as anybody who's done it or tried to do it knows. It's one of the most expensive hobbies that you can find. And there's a, a certain uh, mystique about a race car driver that, that, that is, it's, it's romanticized in a lot of ways. And for good reason, you have to be very lucky and very fortunate in so many different ways to make it. So to have something like Gran Turismo, where you can develop your skills in your living room, you can, for just a few hundred dollars. There's a few games that can actually teach you something that applies that directly to a real world situation. Like the GT Academy obviously is a good example of that where skills learned in the game have translated perfectly one-to-one -one with skills on the racetrack, the real racetrack. Being a race car driver has been my dream since I was a young boy. It would mean everything to be a part of the Nissan racing team. My passion is to drive cars, and this is my opportunity. To get that shot, to drive in front of people who matter. I'm Donnie Jones, host of GT Academy. 400,000 Gran Turismo 5 gamers entered a contest, hoping their skills in the game will transfer to the track. Only the 16 fastest will fight for the ultimate prize the prestigious red helmet and a shot at becoming a professional race car driver for Nissan. These guys come, they've been racing on a game which is pure, which is unless you're good, you can't go fast on that game. And we take them and they've got no knowledge about what the, the world we're in, the world we're here at Silverstone. And we can then train them using the skills they've got from the game in the right way. So they haven't got any bad habits. We can teach them the right way to become racing drivers. Get ready. Go. When the guys win the competition, they then go on what we call the driver development program, which is a physical, mental driver coaching program. It's pretty intense, and they're going through physical exercise every day, uh, mental coaching uh, at least two, three times a week. They're on the simulator, looking at data, having driver coaching, as well as being out on the track in cars as well. So it's a pretty intense time that we work with them for three months to get them prepared and ready for their first race. You know when you're doing something right, when there's lots of people moaning about it um, viciously, it means that you're doing something to upset the establishment, and that's what we've done. But as we've progressed, people have realized these, these guys are genuinely fast, young racing drivers. And they're faster than some of their peers, but they've only raced for one, two, three years. And yet they're, they're to the level or above the level of kids that have been racing for 15 years. Well, for me, uh, I have to say Le Mans, no? Le Mans, competing in Le Mans for the first time in, back in 2011 was very special, no? uh, dreaming to be in that race and uh, obviously then finishing second in the podium uh, with the pole position in qualifying was a really great weekend for me and uh, you know it was a dream become true, no? a dream come true for me uh, and, and for Nissan and for the GT Academy story was, was amazing, no? first time, first try in Le Mans, bam, in the podium. OK, if we'd have had one driver that was good, OK, it was luck. We've got a consistent group of drivers every year from different parts of the world that are really good racing drivers. This is not luck. This is genuinely, if you're a good gamer on Gran Turismo, we can make you into a good racing driver. But GT Academy is, in my view, first and foremost, a life-changing program. It takes people from nothing, if you like, to something very, very special. It gives them the inner belief, it gives them the self-confidence, and it gives them the skills. Not just skills behind the wheel, but skills in front of camera, skills in, in PR. And it gives them all of that 
and makes of them professional race drivers. I think as a child, um, being a racing driver was my ambition. I've dreamed of it before, and um, but I can honestly say I've never dreamt that it would happen this way through playing Gran Turismo. Um, I mean, who thinks of that? えー、と僕が最初にグランツイスモを作った時からの夢ではありましたねあのこういうゲームを作ることでいずれグランツーリスモからレーシングドライバーが生まれるんじゃないかっていう期待は最初からしてましたそういう意図もありましたでただそれはなかなか実現しなかったあるいはまあそれに気づかなかったのかもしれませんけれどもあのそれがようやく。GT アカデミーみたいなプロジェクトを通じて、えー、まあそれを証明するような若い、えー、プレイヤーが現れていったあの想像はしてましたけれども彼らが実際に人生が変わりで本物のレースで活躍しで僕の目の前にいるっていうことがやっぱりちょっと信じられないですね。Every time we, we meet is, is, is great, no? For me, it's like a, a big mentor for me. Uh, every time I have uh, meetings or chats or competing with him in, in Nurburgring 24 hours, it's a special moment, no? Uh, uh, obviously, uh, every time I see him, I, I try to, you know, to, to spend most of the time with, with him, learning from him, and, and obviously, Is, is, is the creator of Gran Turismo, no? the, the simulator which made me uh, a professional racing driver. So I have to, you know, I have to thank him uh, everything. Uh, that's why I'm here today and, and uh, I don't know what to say. The other thing is Lucas and Jan, but they want to achieve something that they want to achieve. あの僕は彼ら,をが彼らがまあ今後多分いろんな困難に直面するでしょうでそれを僕はねやっぱりサポートしたいですよねサポートし続けたいと思ってますね。The awareness that in this arc towards high performance towards mastery that there is a dark side or there's real challenges to the spirit and to the psychology and to relationships that insight typically comes from somebody who's been down that path. And the insight to be able to know that men who are pursuing something that's very important to them, that there's both uh, a part that is glorious and to celebrate, and there's also a really challenging dark side to it, is really insightful. And if we're not careful, we can set people up for the ride and not take care of the other side of it. And to have that insight, to be able to support and challenge and provide opportunity, that's noble. Uh, in Japanese, toge means canyon road or mountain road, the winding road, basically. We just went through the tunnel, and which was actually the, the starting point of my favorite toge roll uh, near my hometown. This is basically the place I learned how to drive. And 10 years ago, I was driving Canyon Road as for fun, and then I just had an opportunity to compete um, in the States. And back then, professional drifting wasn't that big neither. Like, it's not as big as a mainstream racing, but uh, it grows so much. After 10 years, and um, I guess my dream came true that I'm 
I'm now a professional driver. It's not like a driving purely for fun. I have to beat other people. And I have a lot of sponsors, so I have to do well, stuff like that. So sometimes it's not only fun. Sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. Um, but when I come to mountain road like this, it kind of always uh, reminds me how much I enjoy just driving. My goal past 10 years to win the championship of my, my Formula D career and then I achieved that goal two years ago, 2011. Now, another thing that I want to achieve is to have my car in, in the Gran Turismo because Cousin Nori and all the other guys in Gran Turismo are really uh, picky about what kind of car they want to have the game. So. If one of my race car be in a game, that means I'm one of the good ones.自動車メーカーのデザイナーが、ま、何か車を、デザインしよう、作ろうと思った時に、あの、何を寄り所にして車のデザインをしていくのかっていうのは、やっぱり常に悩ましい問題だと僕は思います。あの、なんだっていいっ
った時代があってでそれから現在に至ってるんですけれども,もう全てが、えー、機械化されていてなんか無機質な、まあ、家電みたいな車になってきてるんですけれども、えー、せっかく何て言うんでしょうその手で物を作るっていう技術がどんどんなくなっていってるんですね。だから、えー、もう一回それを見直して、えー機械ではできないようなものを、まあ、味があるものって言いますかハンドメイドの味があるものを、えー、要は機械化でされて作られた車と融合させてよりいいものに。自自動車のことを知れば知るほど自動車車ののここととをを知知知れれればば知るるほほどど作っっててたたち彼らがこれまでやってきた成し遂げてきたこと百数十年の歴史の中で成し遂げてきたことあるいは現に今彼らがやっていることっていうものの凄さがやっぱりどんどん伝わってくるので僕らは本当に少しでも手助けができたら、まあ、光栄だなって思いますよね。Car design has as much about、um, emotion and psychology as it does about hardware and real engineering. And it's that psychology and the emotional connection that I think in the game you get that is very, very different. I mean, to, to come across a rise and to see sun hitting you at a different point of view, to hear shifting inside the car, the, the very thing that you can imagine the car being as a designer, because that's A car designer has to use his imagination as part of his that drives the creativity that he's doing. And so when you're drawing a car, you're thinking about what do I want to see? How, what are the reflections I want to see happening on the side of the car? That's huge. In the game, you would see it. We did a whole project, a concept vehicle project around it. We spent probably two years just trying to make sure do we understand the values, the attributes, the dreams of these different generations? And where are they? And it was interesting. We had, when we talked to a lot of these kids, and we said, well, why don't you know who we are? And they said, You're not where we're at. And that was, that was a daunting task. We think, Well, we're advertising everywhere, we're racing teams, we're selling cars all over the place. How can we not be where you're at? And when you look at the impact of games and what they do, I mean, as a, as a casual experience and lifestyle, these kids in games, they spend a lot of time in games. I mean, it's, it's, it's a place where they, they interact with each other, they socialize, they prove themselves, they, it's a recreation period of time. And so we thought, Well, We're not really there. So please welcome the president of Polyphony Digital and professional race car driver, Kazunori Yamauchi. So we thought, well, why don't we design concept cars for games? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? What if we created the cars that we can't even build in reality in a game? What if we gave you the chance to drive a Corvette with camouflage on it before anybody else gets a chance to do it? Starting today, Everyone can drive a camouflaged Corvette test vehicle on Sony PlayStation's Gran Turismo 5. When it came out in the game,、uh, the, the camouflage car initially, there was a little bit of a leakage beforehand, which wasn't planned or expected, you know, so that was like, <gasps> everybody breathed hard. But the game boards went crazy. I mean, something that was never expected to happen. It's like now all of a sudden, people who never would have talked about Corvettes. We're talking about Corvettes. We designed simulators、uh, for, for, for Kazunori and the guys here in this studio, and we had them on the ground at the Detroit show in January. The, it, the car, the, those simulators, when driving the Corvette, were so in demand that it Completely outstripped our ability to support it. You know, we, couldn't, we couldn't put enough people through the whole system. So there's a long, long line all around the whole exhibit for people wanting to drive the new Corvette. So I think、uh, we've had to adjust 
and kind of move things on the fly because the response among the gaming community has been so profound and so significant. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the new Corvette. We launched it simultaneously in Detroit and they put a, pulled a virtual cover off it on the game. Casanori is very emotional about this. This is, this is very personal. He needs to see the vehicle. He spent time in Detroit to go through the whole program with us. And you know, he says, yes, this will go. We'll put this in the game. So it's not just anybody can build a car and throw it in the game, and it's good to go. Um, I believe their, their sense of, as enthusiasts, that they only want the best. So it was the right car, right time. It's an interesting uh, problem to, to think about anyway, and what kind of idea, what would our ideal uh, GT car be? Um, you know, but I don't know, for me, I think it's more in the pure sports car uh, vein, you know, mm -hmm. but, but pushing technology and pushing design to a more advanced uh, condition. Some companies, they really celebrate their history and their heritage. We, Toyota, we tend to, we tend to be looking more ahead, more down the road than, than behind us. Uh, so maybe there's something uh, just in the spirit of our company and, you know, trying to innovate. We're always trying to innovate and challenge. So I think there's some mindset that way. Um, Ultimately, we all want to make these cars, you know, and you dream about them. And, and, um, and I think technology today, you know, along with Gran Turismo, is like you can bring that closer to reality um, a lot quicker, you know, for, for us as designers as well, and, and for, I think, consumers as well. So it's, uh, it's like making the dream reality, really, you know. Yeah, but yeah, we're talking about making new cars, uh, you know, there's just ideas never stop. I mean, oh, yeah. ま、えっとで、
響いてくれた人たちがまたこう世界を変えていくというか世界に変化を与えていくっていうあのそういうプロセスですね。うんだからムーブメント運動グランツリスモは運動なんだっていう時の運動っていうのはそういう意味ですよね。うん The creative expression, the ability to become so masterful at something and so thoughtful in the basic elements of how it works, that's when the artist in all of us can be expressed. Whether that's in a car, whether that's with a canvas, whether that's in a relationship or conversation, there's a creative process to be able to be fully here now. And that's,、uh, I think that's what we're all looking for. Is to be able to be completely immersed in this moment. And when we can do that over and over and over again and live in this moment in a really high quality way with a very amazing tone, if you will, that's when we get to be close to our potential. And so a life or a professional career, a high performance career, is stringing together as many moments as possible with high tone to them. And are we able to be able to slip into potentially something where we can have an artistic expression with? He drew himself very good. But he's a little bit of 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 a little bit <laughs> to me, Kazunori is a guy who, you know, like I said, he's a perfectionist. But to make a mark in this world, I think that's what his,、uh, you know, his, he's driven to do that. I think he's already done that to a pretty, you know,、uh, to a point with Gran Turismo. I don't think he's quite satisfied yet. I think he wants to, you know, I think he feels he's here for a reason. And, you know, it's up to him. To you know, fulfill his destiny, if you if you will. Do you remember where you were, December twenty third, ninety seven? Eh, to ne. 僕もあのヨドバシカメラとかビッグカメラとかそういう大きなビデオゲームの量販店に行きましたね。で信じられないような長い列がそこにはあってうん、うん、ただただ信じられない、うん、それを遠くから見ていましただからなんか達成感を感じてるとかそういうなんか余裕もなかったっていうかねでもすごく嬉しかったですよ、うん、自分の見てるものを本当に信じられない僕らもねえっ、ー、とグランツリスモの最初のグランツリスモって結構長い時間作っていましたからリリースする寸前までは本当僕らチームのものだったんですよねで
温めて温めて温めてでもうギリギリまで自分たちの手元でホールドしていてで最後にこうリリースしたんですけれどもそのなんか本当に自分たちだけのグランツーリスモがこう自分たちだけのものじゃなくなるっていうその瞬間はやっぱり確かに覚えてますね。そうですね熱病にうなされるように集中してたとしか言いようがないですよねだからなんかそれに集中することで同時に何かを失っているとかそういうことも何も考えなかったですねとにかく。いいものを作っっててもううあそこまで行きたいっていうことしか考えてなくてうん本当それだけですね
Thank <laughs> you.